Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, Ashley. Happy to be here, and thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to chatting a little bit more about Ichi and just kind of like the state of the union, as it were, um, and getting your perspective. But let's start with just a little introduction and personal background. Um, what led you to Ichi? Yeah, I, I was working at IBM, uh, actually in IBM blockchain, and I helped get IBM into crypto at some level. We actually... Uh, I, was instrumental in IBM joining the Hedera Hashgraph uh, Foundation. And I became an advisor to H Hedera and very familiar with the problems of layer one blockchains. And the original concept for Ichi was on how to help solve some of those problems. Now we've since uh, gotten, I, I guess really we've created a number of different products and worked in a number of different areas since then, but that was the initial start. And it's been a very interesting uh, and wild ride, especially compared to working at Amazon and IBM. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, it's it's a that's quite the divergence as far as um, organizational structure goes. I know, right? And um, it, it, who knows what happens next? Yeah, that's the that's the moniker of crypto. Who knows? Yeah, what happens yeah. Next? Um, so. I, I before we started recording, I mentioned that I am pretty new. Like I just started working in crypto this year, um, mm -hmm. and part of my job is to look at the problems facing adoption. Like how do we get more people onboarded, and what does that look like? Um, so, from your perspective, what do you think some of the biggest problems um, are facing the average crypto user? What what keeps people from feeling confident and able to to use DeFi? Yeah, well, the the systems themselves. So you always have some level of risk with anything, um, as we've seen in re in recent days, um, with FTX and other major issues in the market. You can't always trust counterparties or custodians to do the right thing. Uh, in DeFi, you you hope that the code always does the right thing, but the code itself may be prone to logical errors. You may have market attacks or flash loan attacks occurring. And there's always a lot, there just seems to be a lot of hackers that want to get your keys and take your funds. And so it's, it, 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 they're just landmines out there and um, people stumble into them. Um, you know, it, it, it's risky. I think that's um, really the obstacles. And I, I think that all of those obstacles they get solved over time. And when things happen, um, the industry works on that problem and finds a path forward. I just mentioned flash loan attacks, for example. That was it. There was a phase where it seemed over a period of a couple of months, everything was suffering a flash loan attack. But once that type of attack became known, um, and now you, it, it's rarely brought up and Thing, things rotate to new problems er, areas, but it gets robust, more robust and more sound over time. Uh, and, and that seems to be a bit different than um, just people. People don't change in the same way. So I think that this trustless infrastructure has far more long-term potential than what we've come up with in human governance or regulation. Will you explain uh, just for anybody <laughs> what a flash loan attack is oh yeah absolutely so sometimes to you if you can manipulate the price of something uh with a lot of money there there's a chance to gain value right and and that it, for a long time people were kind of stopped because they didn't have the money like they didn't have the money to move the price well the industry innovated and came up with a way of borrowing funds in the same transaction that you pay them back. So basically the funds are borrowed for a zero amount of time. They're atomically returned at the same time you borrowed them, which is a really strange thing. You can't, that didn't exist in the real world. So nobody could see it coming. And so people could borrow enormous sums of money 
and move prices in the same transaction that they pay everything back. Uh, and once that started happening, all the systems in the space had to adjust to detect that type of behavior and block it. So that's what I'm saying. It's just a strange thing that nobody could do before that suddenly became a reality in Web3. Yeah, there are so many, um, just the, it's a new space. And so it's messy when you're trying something new and you're building something that's never been done before, they're going to be unforeseen obstacles. And I guess there's that um, understanding that people have to have when they come in. I think the mindset of the average person who comes into crypto is um, probably some short term investment gain thinking. And that usually prompts uh, riskier behavior. <laughs> um, and yeah. it's important, I guess, I, I think one of the things Ichi is, is doing more of is explaining where the problems are in the current systems and, and how you're working to solve them. Uh, and I really appreciate how in Web3, it is really industry collaboration. When there's something that comes up that nobody saw would be a problem, everybody really works together to fix it, come up with a solution. Um, and it's quite different than anything I've experienced in a, a traditional corporate kind of environment. Absolutely. A lot of times in um, normal corporate environments, information is the edge. And if there's a problem and you know how to solve it, you won't tell people how to fix it because if you don't tell them, maybe your company will be more valuable. Uh, but in this space, everybody's building on top of each other. And it, it, the word is composable. Like if you make something, then I am use it in what we're making. And it all interlinks and, and the code is generally open source and the ideas are usually widely shared. And so I think that it really greatly speeds up the innovation cycles and the amount of time it takes for everything to move forward. And while it, at any moment, it seems like there's the crisis of the week, if you zoom out and look over five years, it's just amazing how far it's come. Yeah. yeah, it's inspiring when we're in places like right now where <laughs> it feels like the sky is falling and everybody's scrambling. Um, but if mm -hmm. you've been in crypto for a little while, then maybe it's not as unnerving and you have the, the long term vision to feel a little more optimistic and comfortable. Um, I wanted yeah. to kind of touch on you mentioned trustless. And when I first entered this space, I recognize that it was because there was not an intermediary, right? We have the computer code that that helps with the transparency piece. But um, trust is such a it's such a an integral part of human relationship and human action. And um, I find that even in projects um, that are decentralized, there's still this room of for trust because you have to trust the people who wrote the code and the audits and the team and the management of the funds. And um, even in a space where it's uh, it's transparent, people have still lost or gotten in trouble. And so I always like to ask people um, things that they consider when they look at getting involved in a new project or red flags that they look for. Do you have anything along those lines to share? Um, I, I, I really think that intent matters a lot. Uh, so if you're, it, no matter what type of organization you're getting involved with, I think meet, meeting the other people that are involved and understanding the principles by which they operate and the reasons that, you know, why they get up in the day and what they're trying to accomplish is probably far more important than uh any anything else um you can you can actually get the same Im, immutable code or very similar from from very different types of people uh, and so i don't i don't really think that i would want a world where you 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 didn't have values or you didn't have beliefs that guide your your decisions and um where it's just code and just automated and just completely trustless uh, but I do think that um, people themselves, just for their own sake, the people with the right intents 
are going to want to take away the controls that would allow abuse. And so while you can't always do that right away, if if the intent behind the project is full decentralization, as we might say in the space, and to throw away the governance keys, then they'll eventually get there. Um, you know, you can't, you can't, it is a spectrum. You might, you might start with something that that's less perfect than your ideal. Uh, but if, if you keep working towards that, you get closer and closer each day. Yeah. I like that. I, and I always try to think of decentralization as a spectrum. I didn't really understand when I first started what that meant, but, um, Every, it's got to start somewhere and uh, people have to be responsible for getting something off the ground. So there is some mm -hmm. level of control that has to be present in the beginning. Um, and then you just beyond that, thinking about like minimum, <laughs> one time I, I was talking about this education program idea that I had with a friend and he showed me this graphic of like starting out, um, with just like a wheel and trying to get to a car. And then he was like, really, you just need to think about it. Like you're starting mm -hmm. on a skateboard. I think a lot of people have seen that graphic, but um, that's a, it was just a nice perspective shift for somebody who hadn't really done a lot of work in a corporate structure or thought about what it takes to really build something new. Um, Cause I was working in an old system, but um, that was a really helpful metric for me to just consider the grace that we have to have as we, start to engage in something that's really different. Yeah, actually, one of the things that um, analogy I've used since this whole, you know, entering this space is just imagine that we are creating a rocket ship and we're going to send it to another galaxy and people are going to be on it and they're supposed to get there and establish a colony or something like that, right? And before they take off, everybody thinks about everything that they'll need for the entire journey because they know that once that ship is in space anything on earth is really no longer useful you know you can't add more fuel you can't put more food on there uh, you can't really change the time frames that much you know and, and so you launch it but then instantly after you launch it problems start popping up and the only thing that you have is the radio signals like an advice and a few inputs to you know and and typically people will just debate in like my imaginary space center what they should do if there's a problem that runs into a space rock or something how how you should manipulate the controls uh what few controls you have and then eventually it gets so far away that you can't even radio signals and it's completely on its own. And that's what creating systems in this space feels like. It's just, just like the moment that you launch it at that point, uh, almost all control is gone and you're kind of watching it. Uh, but there are a few things you thought of that you could maybe as a community agree to adjust or change. Uh, but eventually even that, that starts fading away. I like that analogy a lot. Yeah. Um, well, so I think uh, right when I started, it, we were kind of like coming off the the fumes of DeFi summer. And mm -hmm. I didn't really know what that meant to start, but now I do. And it definitely <laughs> caused a huge splash. Um, there was so much excitement, um, which has definitely waned over the past year. Uh, and in that space, I see just a lot of projects focusing on appealing to the crypto community. A lot of the marketing materials and education that comes out, I and mean, we even have our own language, like different acronyms and words that don't really exist in any other space. And for somebody who's trying to, you know, cut their teeth in crypto, it can feel overwhelming and almost like they're an outsider because they don't, they're not privy to this like secret club with all this new language. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder, what do you think, you know, for somebody who's trying to to come in to crypto, do you feel like there are any large obstacles for DeFi adoption in general for the average person? Well, it, it, it certainly is a time commitment, you know, and, you know, for the average person, if they're not highly curious about that space and want to put in the time to read and ask questions, 
it, it it's probably not going to be time for them to participate, you know, because it, it is, I, I guess it, what I think is that the, the space attracts the very, very curious, the very, very, um, you know, proactive people. And then there are a lot of other people that just don't want to invest the time it takes to learn. Uh, but what I what I re always liked about the space is that there's been this habit of writing things down, and so it it really if you if you want to know it, it's there. It's all written down, and the code's exposed, and even comments in the code tell you what it does. And so somebody really, regardless of background, has it all available to them, and I think that. The real, um, maybe another really challenging part is just ignoring all of the distractions because people like to distill things into um, small sound bites intended to mislead. And as long as you don't get misled by all the people trying to tell you what it all means, you can go figure it all out. Yeah. Normally they say something like, this is what I think, but D-Y-O-R, do your own research. They don't really mean that. If they, they could have just said, go read the doc. But they're trying to influence you with the first part and then disarm you with the second part. <laughs> it's, it's, Clever. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think there's definitely some personal responsibility. I mean, that's that's really if you're going to manage your own keys, you have to know what's going on, and mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a level of personal responsibility that people have to be to enter right now. Maybe in the future, it'll be much simpler. Um, but I I was kind of considering like even comparing with traditional finance, how many people are informed and actively engaged in you know planning for their own retirement. And so I did a little research and I saw that um, recent Gallup poll showed about 58% of U.S. adults own stocks, but more than half feel behind on the retirement savings. And then most of them don't actively like manage their accounts. They don't really choose what they're mm -hmm. investing in. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because if, if we're not even really informed and educated on our own systems that we have in place right now, then taking it to the next level might not be the next, the, the right step for the most person, most people. Yeah. I, I, th I, I do think that there's the technology either um, it, it becomes beautiful or it becomes invisible. There's the two choices, right? And uh, that was said by somebody far wiser than me in the space. Um, I I don't think that it's becoming more beautiful, right? Like when, when you look at the applications that are on chain and the number of choices and options, they it's become more complicated over time, not not more simple. And so in and then the, the people involved no more and the learning curve to enter is bigger and so the it is likely that um in my opinion that most people in end up interacting are benefiting from DeFi through an interface controlled by somebody um again that person may not have the ability to custody their funds or really spend their funds in ways that they don't choose but they make the choices simple and they provide a valuable service i think what where we misstepped as an industry um was that they they actually started to take control of the funds and they abstracted away the risk and, and the person had no knowledge of the risk that was being undertaken. And that's the mistake. That's the line you shouldn't cross. If, if you're going to, if you're going to make the decisions of what risk to do with other people's funds, uh, you probably belong in the regular banking system. You know, we don't need to reinvent all of that. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> 
<laughs> so I think I think that there's a way to make the options available to users in a way that the the basic risks are somewhat understood and they can choose the menu. As I mean, let's face it: if you go to Robinhood, you can choose from thousands of weird exotic investments and options and whatnot that in Robinhood tries to tell you what they are. And people are actually pretty good at making these choices. They actually get into it. Uh, but I do think that you don't have to worry about flash loan attacks on Robinhood and random people taking your keys with fake websites, right? So there's just things that normal people shouldn't be exposed to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and that's the level we have to get to. Um, yeah. if, if we're trying to create a system that would provide opportunity for equity and, you know, a, a space where people can transcend their geographic, socio-political boundaries, um, then we need to be able to offer tools that are straightforward and clear um, for people people who are unbanked because likely those people also don't have the resources um, to learn and how to manage all of that on their own, not because um, they don't have the infrastructure, but also they don't have the, the education available to them. So being able to create financial tools that are easy to use and clear um, is the only way that it can be what I get most excited about, which is mm -hmm. an opportunity for people to um, really change the way that they live. Exactly, yeah. Um, so in thinking about that, I was considering, um, you know, what parts of the world need DeFi the most. And I was thinking about communities that rely on digital payment systems already. Um, and like cross-border remittance. So maybe communities where a lot of people um, migrate and then they send funds back home or whatever the case may be. Um, and there's a huge boom in Latin America. And I'm just curious if you've seen any focus on um, developing for specific communities like that within the space and if that's anything that's on your radar. Well, I think that one... Um... I guess I don't. I don't want to say um, solved because I mean a lot of people don't know about it. But I do think that a lot of people got into crypto because of cross-border remittance, um, and they certainly, you know, it it actually works, right? So you know, it, it, that's usually the aha moment. Somebody sends sends or receives bitcoin around the world and they they think wow that was amazing that was a lot different than um you know what i was using before and then of course the different crypto projects focused on that like to talk about you know the the fee savings or which one's best for it but no we're, here at Ichi, we're not really focused on on that as I just think people have done an amazing job with it. I can't think of how to make it better, so we wouldn't we wouldn't really need to. Um, I think it works, yeah. You know, but obviously, the awareness of it needs to improve. But yeah, I don't. We're 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 more focused on, um, I guess, an, another problem, which is that people once they have the tokens. Um, how do they earn with them? You know, because they're just sitting there. They're they're not making anything. How do, how do I begin to earn? Um, and it, do I have to go to go back to fiat currency to earn? Do I need to take excess risk to earn? How do I just think that um, when somebody gets the tokens, you know, whoever whatever system they used and whatever token it happens to be how do you begin to to deposit it and just earn a little bit more which is a kind of obvious use case and and so we're we're focused on enabling that for any token yeah and so they they can do the cross-border remittance 
with whatever token they want, but then they might want to use Ichi to earn a little more of it. Well, let's talk about a little more about that. So liquidity provision mm -hmm. is kind of one of the first strategies that people learn about in DeFi to grow their assets, um, but a lot of them lose. So what are some of the problems with um, these automated market makers? So when the, the first generation of automated market makers came out, um, I mean, it, it was groundbreaking at the time. And I think that it, it immediately found market fit as you, you, you couldn't do that on chain without, without it. And you previously had to send your tokens to some centralized custodian to, to swap them for something else. So just going from nothing to something was a huge win, but it was also very simplistic. Like the, the liquidity provider, um, by the way, liquidity is the money that's available for you to trade against. It helps you buy and sell close to the last price. And it, it's not normally put there by another trader. It's put there by somebody called a liquidity provider. Now, liquidity providers, they're, they're for-profit entities. Like, yeah, I'm putting my money at risk, my tokens at risk, and I expect to earn a profit because I'm putting them at risk. Otherwise, I'll just keep them, you know? Uh, but the they, market making's been incredibly high speed. It's competitive. It, you know, you're trying to place both bid and ask orders. And, and so in that context, the, the, the early systems designed in DeFi, they just naively placed the money at all price points from zero to infinity. And arbitragers just drain the system of value. So I think last year, maybe there was about a billion dollars in trading fees on Uniswap, which is the most popular decentralized exchange. But there was $1.2 billion in these arbitrage losses. So the liquidity providers were actually unprofitable. So it's not really a great idea to, to earn if you're going to put your money in and get a negative yield. Right. So that, that was the problem to solve. And the way that we solved it was basically by not building for liquidity providers at all. You know, instead of trying to build for this user that wants to take both sides of the market, we just built for the people who have the token and they want its value to increase. They wanna keep it. And we built the system so that it doesn't oversell it. It tries to avoid overselling it. And since it doesn't oversell it, it's able to give, give it back to the user with the additional fees and profits. Um, again, that now that by the way, none of that is guarantees it will always work. There are some edge risk um, if price is moving incredibly quickly. Uh, but for the 31 vaults we've launched so far, it's worked for all of them. And we're working with additional partners to cover the um, the it's the final edge risk. So you you mentioned um, the vaults that you've launched so far and you know, Ichi uses a different measure of success or rather tries to use a different metric to paint the picture of, you know, how the vaults are doing. Um, most projects use APY, which can be an unclear picture and made to look super attractive. Can you explain IRR, um, internal rate of return and, and how that works? Yeah. So I first learned about IRR in business school. We were taught we were taught it in um, trying to understand the profitability of an apartment complex. You know, so I'm going to have this much rent come in. I'm going to I'm going to pay these mortgages. I've got expenses like utilities or maintenance. But at the end of the day, with all of these cash flows in and all these cash flows out, was there a positive annualized return on the value I put in? Right. And so IRR is just a simple way of taking the date of each of those cash flows in and cash flows out, and then uh, arriving at the annualized return 
that would result in those cash flow from those cash flows, those dates and the final amount. So there's nothing missing. There's nothing. Uh, it's just an accurate representation of what it's done to date. Um, there's no attempt to say that that's what it will do in the future. I mean, in the apartment world, maybe my building burns down the next month, right? Um, the APYs and APRs are, in my opinion, just lazy, right? They look at one aspect. Maybe it's a reward rate. Maybe it's a fee stream. They typically look at it over a very narrow window of time, maybe the last 24 hours. And then they extrapolate it out for a year. It's like standing in the middle of a hurricane with a rain gauge, measuring how much rain happened, and then predicting that will be the annual rainfall. It's, it's, it's logically inconsistent and misleading. So we just wanted to put something there that says exactly what's happened. Thank you for explaining. Yeah. So um, we've talked about how vaults can be helpful for, for users, for people to who just need a place that they can deposit their assets to grow. Um, but how about for projects? I know that having liquidity kind of spread out in a lot of different places can be a real challenge. How can vaults support projects? Yeah, so the, the basic issue here is that um, you want to be able to buy and sell any asset close to the last price, right? And if you can do that, um, value is able to move more freely. Um, you are, you're able to build the DeFi applications we're all imagining. The new Web3 business models can, can prosper and people can participate and move their value from one system to the next and everything kind of works together. So it, 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 it's kind of like the bandwidth of Web3. Like in Web2, and I used to work at Amazon, as, and I was familiar with this, as the speed of people's internet access improved, new business models became possible. Right. And there were businesses that you could run once everybody had high speed internet that you couldn't operate when they had dial up internet. And so that web two was all about all of this sending of data, sending of messages. In web three, it's about value and whether or not you can translate it from one thing to the other. And that, that bandwidth or the ability to do so is the liquidity. Now, Liquidity on something like FTX, Coinbase, Binance, it may be useful for traders and speculators. Well, I'm not saying maybe, it absolutely is. Helps them get better trade execution, but it doesn't actually improve the utility of anything in DeFi or Web3. What, what really matters in those cases is on-chain liquidity. And the challenge with on-chain liquidity is it, it's been unprofitable to create it. We just talked about that earlier. So by making it profitable for the first time, now any project can have good on-chain liquidity at, at really no cost to them because they're actually earning instead of losing money. And so what we're working with is basically just identifying with, 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 with each project where the tokens necessary to create that liquidity come from. And so sometimes they, they may come from the team and the advisors and all the VCs that are owed those tokens, and they can actually earn on those tokens prior to receiving them while creating the liquidity. Sometimes it might come out of the, the project's treasury. Sometimes it might be crowdsourced by their community. And sometimes it may just come from some hedge fund or investor in the space that has either wants to own a lot of tokens or likes borrowing them and depositing them. So that's the process we'll work through as we uh, engage each project and understand their needs and, and try to build deep liquidity for every project in the space. And, and ultimately that's what's gonna make all of their, their projects work and succeed because it, it, they won't work and succeed relying on centralized exchanges like FTX. That should be painfully obvious now. 
painful <laughs> word there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. We learned that lesson again and again. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 whole space is pointless if we just create random little tokens that then get custodied by centralized companies who then fail us. We we might as well just stick with the system we have if that's the end game. And you, um, and I'm not sure if you touched on this, but vaults are non-custodial. So people are still in charge of their assets. Exactly. Yeah. The, 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 the vaults are very simple. They only have three functions, deposit, withdraw, and rebalance. And um, deposit and withdrawal can only be called by the, the people who have the funds in their wallet. Um, so as, as I've been kind of like trying to keep my, my finger on the pulse of what's going on in DeFi regulation mm -hmm. is on the top of everybody's mind and on every headline, just about, um, how do you view the relationship between regulators and DeFi? Well, I think that, um, the, the on and off ramps you know, they have, they, they should be regulated. So these are in these centralized exchanges and other types of custodians because they, you know, you, you put your, you know, you might wire, you might send your money to them and then you rely on them to perform a service as a custody provider to, to, to keep your money safe. Uh, and if there is no regulation, there's no oversight, they, they may not do that. Now, now, DeFi is completely different. In that instance, the software is written, it's installed on computers, and then the author of that software can't change it, can't do anything about it, and it runs on hundreds of thousands of computers globally, and nobody can do anything about it. So that, that in that instance, the code is really what is keeping your funds safe or not. And like you said, you know, definitely don't put much in there because it's still new and there are a lot of risks that you have to understand if participating. And most people probably won't understand them, so they shouldn't participate directly uh, because there is nobody that can help them if they lose their keys. There's no customer service desk. There's nobody that has your money. And so in that context, there's really... Um, not a need for regulation so you can't there's nothing that anybody can do that they're supposed to be doing there's no regulated activity occurring so what what i think is that hopefully the people learn those distinctions and they regulate where people are actually doing things that should be regulated and they don't regulate where they're not but um you know world the world is uh, a complicated place and not all jurisdictions will see things equally and, and the main thing that we do is just try to obey all the relevant laws everywhere and um and not not do things that are against the rules yeah <laughs> yeah i think um the media tends to focus on like the scams and the rug pulls and just the, mm -hmm. the sad things <laughs> that happen. Well, um, we already have rules against that. Yeah. And they get prosecuted. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's true. It's true. And, but yeah. I, you know, it kind of, they're kind of positioning like investors as being victims. Um, but then mm -hmm. at the other side of their mouth, it seems like um, Dow members are starting to, to be under fire for some of the activities of a DAO. Um, I, I mentioned Uki DAO in a previous conversation. I don't think this is going to hold up. Um, some new developments have come out on that, but it, I thought it was really interesting that um, they tried to hold DAO members who had, I mean, just voted in anything governance wise, like it could be something as simple as, oh, I, I like this logo over that one as being responsible for the activities of the DAO. And um, in my mind, that could really hinder people's willingness to participate and be involved for fear of being held responsible for things that they don't necessarily understand or didn't even contribute to. Um, 
I don't know if you saw anything like that, um, but um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard, um, I haven't looked into that particular case or or whatever. But I would say that my general bias is for for less governance and less fewer votes and more things that just work completely trustlessly. You know, like I the the um. Yeah, I, I, um, sometimes Dow governance can feel worse than normal enterprise governance or normal governance. And so I don't know what, what's going on there or what people did or why they're, well, I don't know any details, but uh, just because people are voting on chain doesn't mean that they're better people. And sometimes I think that it's just good to, not have them capable of doing anything yeah yeah I saw <laughs> mango markets was, was like yeah. hacked recently and and the yeah. people in the dow were able to vote on whether or not they wanted to prosecute and i was like i don't know if that's a decision you get to make but okay <laughs> yeah well I, again i don't I, I certainly all of these things are super complicated and i don't know what's what's happening with any individual situation but yeah the um the again i think less is more that's just in general we we should be striving for sometimes you have to have governance controls as you're getting started but don't put one in place without a plan to get rid of it that's what i think that's, yeah. that's good <laughs> <laughs> gonna jot that down for other yeah. people that were <laughs> that's great yeah. um okay well i think we kind of covered most of the topics that I had for us today. Um, are there any other announcements or news updates, anything you want to share? Um, well, I mean, I th basically you can follow us on Twitter. Um, you can check us out on Telegram. I assume those links will be available. Yeah. And uh, and um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions, engage in the community. And, and most of all, Ashley, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much. Awesome.